I'm Steve, the bookman Eisenstein in Miami Beach. I'm Thorne Donnelly, broadcasting from our new office in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. And I'm Lynn Thompson with Henry Bemis Books in Charlotte. And joining us today over my right shoulder, or possibly your left, is Shadow the Cat. And this is the Rare Book Cafe, the world's only internet program about antiquarian books, sponsored by the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair, which is being held April 21st through the 23rd at the Coliseum in St. Petersburg. Today, we're off to Cape Cod for a bookseller interview. We'll be talking a look, we'll be taking a look at a Disney-themed miniature book. Thorne Darnley will be talking about the crown jewel of his family's publishing publications. And I've got some tips for you if you are looking for ways to sell books at consignment locations. First, we've got a video for you today. Saturdays are busy days for most booksellers, so earlier in the week, I sat down at the computer for a video interview with one of the legends of Cape Cod bookselling, Jim Visbeck of Isaiah Thomas Books. My co-host, Lindsay Thompson, joined us and put Jim through our third degree. Lindsay is also producing today's program. So, Lindsay, as soon as the video is ready, we are... Okay, Steve, I'm going to push the button now, and kind of like uh, every anarchist, I'm going to sit back and see what happens next. Boom. Okay, we have it up. We're just waiting for it to talk. Yeah, I was going to say, I look a little frozen right now. <laughs> yes, you are. Uh, you are frozen. <laughs> it says screen sharing and presenting to everyone. Uh, I'm not seeing the start button being clicked. There we go. We right. talking, so, there we go. It is Beck of Isaiah Thomas Books here on the Rare Book Cafe. Jim, welcome to the Rare Book Cafe. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. Jim has a bookstore of beauty because we have visited there and stayed there in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, in Katua. Jim, how long have you been in the Rare Book business? And tell us about your store, what, what you specialize, generalize in? Well, I've been in the book business since um, two, probably, because uh, when I worked in Worcester Public Library, the, my hangout at noontime was bookstore. Uh, way. Finally, Mr. Ephraim said, you're here, so what do you want to drop? So I went from being a lowly at a library, which is good now, just a clerk, for a, a man who started during the Depression with books and with uh, ripped off covers of magazines, which he would buy from the drugstore. They would get their credit by sending the covers back. So as a kid during the Depression, and you know, the best part of it was he never threw anything away. So I had years, years, besides working in four libraries, of looking at books. Oh, well, maybe I specialize in what Mr. Ephraim used to call uh, paying the rent. <laughs> I 
it's been wonderful ever since. Poor man, he uh, burned down, building burned down. And so there was a case for me to start on my own. I worked for the year for him. And then uh, with one of my very best customers in Worcester, we started in 1969. Myself and Reverend Taylor. And it's been wonderful ever since. You have, you have an extensive display of books around. Display of books around. Think a tremendous echo. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. You have even a beautiful downstairs room. Take a, can you take us on a verbal tour through the store? Some of the things we might look at there. What do you mean besides the books? Yeah. Well, oh, what's behind you? For a second. Uh, that's part of the, my store is my cat, who is not downstairs because we're not having a winter storm right now. We're just having rain, thank goodness. But the cat only comes down when there's sunlight coming through the front door. People come for my cat and for my books, I must have been. Oh, what's behind me are these uh, reference books I idly ever use, <laughs> including a postcard here of an upcoming book fair in April in uh, in St. Pete. I'm looking forward to that. Well, that's April 21st. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 we've made it as pleasant as possible. This is an 1871 sort of late Victorian house, which is pink and four other colors. We've got children's room with a children's and cookbook room, which I think works pretty well. The kids are playing with huge oversized uh, uh, stuffed toys and looking at books, and mom is looking at the kids and their cookbooks. And we've got uh, three places where people fall asleep generally in the store made it as comfortable as possible because I live upstairs um, oh I should have had pictures somewhere but I don't what what will be some of the things that you're gonna bring to the book fair which by the way is April 21st through 23rd at the Coliseum in st. Petersburg what are some of the things that you're gonna be bringing that you know of now Buying books around here is so exciting. You can't believe it. There are such tremendous libraries here on Cape Cod and in the Northeast in general. One of the proudest things that I have, I'm going to hold up, it is Carl Sagan's first book, Intelligent Life in the Universe. He wrote it with some Russian, which I person's name which I can't pronounce but it was inscribed to a Woods Hole Woods Hole is famous for the Oceanographic Institute and uh, it's inscribed to a gentleman who has passed away I think Kimball Atwood and he was a molecular biologist in uh, helping the government in World War II down in Tennessee and out in Nevada, probably, on the effects of, uh, on, on, on human life. It's inscribed Carl's first book to, to a molecular biologist who says, patient of a Martian biology with all best wishes <laughs> goosebumps in anticipation of a martian biology that's a heck of a book <laughs> so i'm bringing that and does the book, about the, book oh, the book say whether there's any intelligent life here or on mars <laughs> book I have difficulty, except I have it behind glass, putting it either in the science section or the UFO section or the uh, 
I have within my own little group here. We have it, <laughs> you know. So good to be there sometimes too. But we'll be bringing that and uh, other lo local things. I've just got to come across a signed outermost house, Cape Cod. Signed, signed by Henry Besson. Uh, his wife was uh, uh, Elizabeth Bishop. So that's a neat thing to have. So, Jim, let me ask you a question: Is Gladys Tabor still hot on the Cape? Oh, uh, yes. More and more people are uh, requesting large type petitions. <laughs> 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 you know, like uh, uh, when I worked in my town library, I used to go up the street and deliver to who couldn't get out. And at that time, it was all Gladys Hasty Carroll. We two button books. You know, doesn't get to, doesn't get beyond the second button. <laughs> uh, so that has the day, but no, Gladys is, and like May Sark, and very, very popular with the you know, older readers. Do anybody, oh, does like anybody it. still remember Mary Ellen Chase? Oh, you betcha. Mary Ellen yeah, Chase. Yeah. She was, uh, she and her partner taught at Amherst for a thousand years, and she wrote a lot of Northeastern based novels. Mm -hmm. Farrah Weir Bassett is one of the favorites around here. Who is the artist? Osgood, we, Edward Gore, wasn't Edward Gorey from the Cape? Oh yes, he, uh, he was from uh, Down Cape, the end of his life, yeah. And uh, he was did you know, did you, Pardon? Did you know him? Uh, as much as I could, because he was, he was very shy. And if you wanted to know, as far as I can concern, is you had to present yourself to him. <laughs> and he'd come in, his hands were full of wonderful big silver rings, not like uh, football rings or anything, but dragons and snakes and skulls, <laughs> sort of uh, hard rock hippies kind of rings and all that. Um, but yeah, I. Time everybody recognizes you. I think he was sort of, you know, he doesn't put himself out, but he was very charming when he came in. And uh, uh, when my eyes lit up, <laughs> and so I have a wonderful story about about him. There was just down the street at Katuit. It's an old building that has. Uh, burned down, unfortunately, but he used to have uh, a, a theater group and, it, and he put on little plays, little stupid plays uh, all the time. And I was sitting at one and he was sitting in the back because there's only four seats. But anyway, and they, the stage set rope across uh, that uh, one quarter of the building the sheet over it and one of the, uh, the the narrator and two other people and uh, the narrator says all of a sudden a big billowy white cloud goes by and so somebody behind the sheet and the rope holds up a, bo a milk bottle a plastic milk bottle <laughs> and and waggles it across the sky. <laughs> Glory Laughter. Well, there you get a sense of the guy. <laughs> a, a sense of the absurd, which was what was he still wearing raccoon coats then? Uh go is in the, the Gory House Museum, which is uh, uh, in um, Yarmouth Port, and uh, you know what I did? The 
the best thing I saw that at a uh, a book fair uh, a couple of months ago was I bought a raccoon coat. I stood over there in a chair by Gory Books, and I said, well, "Come on, try it on. You could be Edward Gory too." Shots to know that. But I brought it to a fair. Woman tried it on and was perfect. Couldn't believe it. Just couldn't believe it. Fit her like a tea. And she was. She and I were the happiest. That I sold this raccoon coop for. <laughs> Did you ever get into a? Did you ever uh, did you ever have a chance to ask him why he chose the nom the plume of Osgood Weary or was there any any reason ever given why he wrote under oh. nom the plumes? Uh, weren't they all sort of uh, mixed up uh, letters? What's that called? They were anagrams on his name. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, they Audre and Weary and um, and all sort of uh, as he played with his own letters too. So uh, just have much fun with it. Yeah, uh, no, I. I posed that question along the lines of when Stephen Stephen King, from what I heard, Stephen King wrote under the nom diploma to see if he get published as well as he did when he wasn't writing under his own name. So, you know, somebody that had contact with an author, and I knew they had a nom diploma. It would, you know, besides an anagram, I just thought maybe there was well, a story behind it. He had a wonderful style, and I mean, I don't. The fun of it was like thinking about it because you can recognize his style. You know, old uh, uh, when he worked for Doubleday and and did uh, covers for the uh, Doubleday Image, the religious group, uh, and Doubleday Anchor. You look at this book and say, well, "Wait a minute, this is not a two dollars and fifty cent paperback anymore. This is a five dollar paperback. This is Edward Corby's cover." I don't know. It wouldn't have done them any good because people will say, I know who did that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I am, we have a portion of the program now called The Third Degree. And since you are a new guest on the show, you are absolutely sitting in the third degree chair. And I am going to have. Oh. That is either. Well, you will find out because Lindsay is now going to ask you a series of questions that we fondly term the third degree, and he'll also explain why we fondly term them the third degree. Well, this is akin to the uh, the classic scene in Laura when Detective McPherson hauls Laura down to the station and sits her in a chair roughly and flips on the big light in her face and starts asking her harsh questions intended to determine okay. whether or not the truth is in her. And so these are based but literally on, these are based loosely on the, uh, the James Lipton style actors uh, studio questions, the Proust questionnaire, there's a, a thousand of them. Uh, Do this unless I can see your blue cards. This is book court and we don't need no thinking <laughs> cards. <laughs> All right. So you're gonna, you're gonna take it and you're gonna like it. The exaltation of larks. I will I will quote anything out of uh, the exaltation of larks. Go ahead. Anything you, anything you say can and may be edited out by Alan later. <laughs> so uh, to start with, as, as an exculpation for the scope of your life. Uh, or philosophy have you lived by? Uh, uh, do some good. Uh, do some good. Everybody has asked me 
somebody has asked me to to work for them. My hometown librarians, uh, Blaine Taylor, tired of all this minister. Uh, soon became a superintendent. I said, why do you want that job? You could be bishop. I make bishops. <laughs> <laughs> I make bishops. He always said to me, he says, I have. When I questioned him, I said, well, who do you? People are telling you their woes all the time. Who do you go to? Well, but what he said, he says, I have the best job in the world because what I do is help people. I get somebody in the mic holding up a hundred bucks to help another parishioner with their rent. So uh, I just admired the heck out of him. He's passed away because he was always doing good for somebody. And you know, they're like libraries. Working for our libraries. We used to, uh, in the public library I worked in, people would drop their kids off for the whole day of Saturday and pick you up at five o'clock. You know, so. And, and here, too, it's very flattering because working in a bookstore is very flattering. People trust you. You're, you're here to help them find something. In the meantime, I can pay the rent. Once a summer, I go out for a lobster dinner, you know. So, philosophy is to uh, help somebody. Yourself with beauty, you surround yourself with books, it's very comforting. So, better than flipping hamburgers. <laughs> okay, do some good. Speaking of the making of bishops and other ecclesiastical matters, is there a heaven? And if there is, does it have books? I have a, I'll be another quote. Um, a South American uh, to, uh, I forget. Or take a essay or somebody like that says, if there's a heaven, I imagine it to be a library. Yeah. Oh, Boris. Who said that? Uh, Boris. One of his famous Boris, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the imaginary yeah. library as a tryout for heaven. Okay. That's good enough. <laughs> uh, aside from this, uh, aside from this discussion, uh, what is or has been the best time of your life as a bookseller? The uh, it was uh, because of that man, uh, Blaine Taylor, and his family. I was out hustling in the early years, and I made a good buy. And I made a very good buy, unbeknownst to myself, except later on when I searched it all. Uh, you know, he had all the books and all the money, and I had all the energy. So, so I made a very good buy, and he's Blaine said to me, as senior partner, of course, he says, Take a thousand dollars, do something. So, that was my first trip abroad. I went to the easiest place I could go, which was to England, and had a wonderful time, even though I was by myself. I had a wonderful time. So, Wanderlust, that started the idea where it says that said, you got a little extra. You know, let's, uh, let's, let's buy a memory. You know? I should live on you. Gonna buy inside you. I mean that lobster every summer. 
passes. <laughs> so, but this first of, of, of uh, uh, bookshops and uh, and just walking around, I just walked and walked and walked and absorbed it all. My best memory. Nice one. Yeah. Of all the uh, books you've read, uh, is there a fictional hero in any of them that you most identify with? Uh, I feel guilty reading fiction. Uh. No. I can't remember the character, but science fiction pieces that I read was nothing except every 10 years somebody asked me for it. It was something like Mr. Fuzzy or something like that. It was science fiction character. <laughs> I read fiction out of the New Yorker. So I can't answer that. Well, then uh, a variation on that. Do you, do you, Excluding all of fiction, do you have any guilty pleasure non-fiction reading? Oh, well, uh, that's the same uh, wanderlust that I got for uh, hopping across the pond for a week. Makes me want to read uh, sort of atmospheric books. Uh, what's the name? Uh, Peter, Peter Mayle, who uh, continuous favorites even today, I remember with satisfaction. Uh, you know, uh, I'm in France or uh, uh, living in Italy for a couple of years and coming back and that sort of things. Uh, so the, the, I saw the New Yorker kind of uh, writer. Uh, who will who want to know about oranges, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> or uh, there's a, a Florida book about, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't remember much of it. An alligator will eat an orange, I'm sure. But uh, <laughs> that, that side of the book that uh, just take you away. People who recommend science fiction to me and other things like that, and I keep saying, "Well, go that far away. I'm all right." <laughs> you know, but anything that will keep you amused uh, and occupied, give you a little look at if you uh, wish you could do another week, like kind of. And our traditional last question uh, before we decide what to do with the witness is, uh, what's your favorite curse word? And yes, you can say it on the air. Well, mostly, mostly uh, said towards myself. You get up and you look in the mirror, and there's a horse. <laughs> You. <laughs> Sometimes it's not so bad. Uh, filled with did I myself like you know, why did you do that? Like it that I said, so <laughs> that's it. Well, I thank you for uh, taking time to be a good sport with us. Uh, Stephen, I think uh, we can release this one on his own recognizance. Okay, I concur on that one. Um, but I'll tell you, it was nice to hear somebody that's also a longtime rare book dealer, because trust me, I'm in the minority on this, I thought, but I'm not alone. I'm not the only one that doesn't read, fic does not read that much fiction. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an in-joke. <laughs> it's a joke. Um, I confess that even though I've been in the rare book business, you know, three quarters of my adult life, I'm not a fiction reader. And, 
you know, in conversations around book fairs, it's usually, you know, if, if we're not talking books, somebody's talking literature. So, you know, I'm, it's nice to know I'm not alone. <laughs> That's all. Chimp, thanks for taking the third degree. Um, you are going to be at the book fair with us April 21st through 23rd. That's the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair. We are going to be celebrating many, many, I believe it's 36 years of book selling. Uh, this event, there's going to be dealers in it from all over the country, all over the world. We are happy for many years that, you know, you have been at the show and, and we hope continuous, you know, great book sales as they always are at the show. What are some of the other things that you might be bringing? in front of you maybe somebody's looking for that one-of-a-kind something that's there because I know having seen your inventory you have a lot of great stuff there we go <laughs> okay. local contacts uh, I mean local folks around here that have uh, their proximity and their family's proximity has uh, um, has made it a joy to go out and, and look for books. I have a copy of uh, uh, well, let me see this one. Uh, Dorsey's Airship Manual, which is balloons, and I got this from the same family. This what the airship manual on um, how to fly dirigibles and all Wait, that. Of course. When was that published? Yeah. Wow. Oh, during World War, during World War One. This was. Um, what was it? That's a great subject area. And it's inscribed by Ensign George Crompton, naval aviator. Naval Reserve Flying Corps. And this is a, this is the the Crompton family from Worcester was Crompton and Knowles. They were loop makers and uh, early uh, was, uh, and this is their kid. He was a launcher an airplane off of a balloon. Uh, at this time, his his credits included an airship, uh, um, uh, let's see, New Jersey, I think it was, to Ohio or whatever. It doesn't sound like much now, but uh, but at the time, he was at the top of his game. So I have this uh, airship manual, and I believe it must have his own copy of uh, uh, the history of the guys uh, uh, during balloon service overseas and yeah. You know. Was that the only ballooning book or did they have things earlier in color plate? That's an interesting book to travel oh. alone. Well, it, it don't have the two things. The the airship manual and, the, and this balloon section uh, as, as part of the uh, military uh, heritage. You know, by now this is great, 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 how many uh, uh, um, generations afterwards. What I really was interested in when I heard this was part of the Crompton family is back in Worcester, uh, of course they were industrialists, had a lot of money, and they built their biggest, their big mansion on the top of one of the seven hills of Worcester. And it was uh, later turned down, uh, torn down and the most prominent hospital in Worcester, St. Vincent's Hospital was built on that very site. The stone wall and some giant uh, trees uh, next to the carriage house, uh, which wasn't torn down. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Uh, the, the estate was torn down and the carriage house was still there for a long time. But I was looking for this hot book that was published just for friends and family about this this named house. But, uh, 
there, I don't know, we might come across something more Booker T. Washington uh, <laughs> that was open to uh, uh, the, uh, a, a family that lives in Keturit. The family started Keturit's little town library. And the uh, one of the relatives of that family was uh, uh, a social novelist, anti-slavery social novelist. And so this book was given to her, and it has remained um, in private hands until now. And, you know, the rest of you guys, you know, finding wow. out the history. Nice. Uh, and where this book came from is a great part of the joy of this business. Like, I've been uh, selling like, like mad the books, the religious books, the religious library of a man named Colin Williams, who was at one time dean at Yale Divinity, was down here nice. and passed away. And, just, and uh, they're annotated, and people are coming back and rifling through, see what are the annotations that they can find. Wonderful scholarly library. Yeah, the book hunting up in the Cape from oh. from the years I've known you and heard has just got to be absolutely phenomenal. I mean, your your inventory is living proof of that. Lindsay, do you have any questions or thoughts for Jim? I don't, except that I want to uh, find an excuse to get up and see the store sometime. I appreciate you taking the time to visit with us today. Oh, my and pleasure. And Jim, just for the record, give us a way to contact you. So if somebody sees something or hears something in this episode, how can they reach you at Isaiah Thomas Books in Catuit, Massachusetts? My email is is thomas, like Izzy Thomas, is thomas at aol.com. The man of I've never changed since AOL. Uh, <laughs> And of course, www.isaiahthomasbooks.com and all that. I'm at 508-2752. And I'm also at one of the best book shows uh, this spring in April in St. Petersburg, Florida at the Coliseum. And if somebody has never been there, it's a, for dealers, it's a wonderful venue. It's romantic. It's easy for us to get in and out and, so, and for the customer as well. It's a charming place to visit. There's a lot going on there, absolutely. We, we all look forward to it. And Jim, thank you much for thank you very much for being our guest on the show. I hope you avoid the heavy parts of the snowstorm. Tell Hank we say hello and stay warm. Bye, guys. And that's our uh, video for today, Steve. Actually, Steve has gone off on his break, and I see Edie is with us now. So, hello, Edie. Hello. What have you got for us today? Oh, I'm delighted to be here again today. And today, I'm going to be talking about a collection of miniature golden books, most of them by Walt Disney. And when I was researching this set, of which there were 36 little books, it led me to read about Walt Disney and miniatures. It seems that Walt Disney had a real passion for everything that was miniature. And he started to collect objects that were miniature uh, by having two of his secretaries go online or advertise for anything miniature to be sent to them so that nobody would see the name Walt Disney and jack up the prices. Anyhow, he started by building a Lionel train set for his nephew, whose name was Roy E. Disney. And he wanted all the structures and all the landscapes to be exactly down to scale. Then he saw Mrs. James Thorne had an exhibit at the Golden Gate International Expo in 1939 of miniature furnishings and accessories. Her collection was extensive dealing with everything and he got absolutely enthralled with it and built a miniature train set 
that he called Carrollwood Pacific that was right on his property. He lived on Carrollwood Drive and he hired someone to make everything and draw everything down to scale the same as it would have been in the Old West. He then started co to collect everything miniatures and he had a huge miniature book collection himself. And it was a mini world. Ken Anderson was the man that he hired to draw 24 scenes from Western towns. And he put him on his payroll so that he would be able to have everything exactly. Now, one of the miniature books in the collection, which I pulled out here is number 33, and it's called The Seven Dwarves. Now, in these books, the rear cover of every single one, catalog, of what these 36 books are. I have checked this catalog against my collection and I do have them all. The books, as they got older, the front and the rear covers had absolutely beautiful illustrations. And then inside the books, you could sign it over to somebody you had illustrations there. Mm. And on every page of every book, there is an illustration. Some of them larger than others, but you could read these books, every single one of them, without a magnifying glass. They are absolutely adorable. Now, I have my books in a loose leaf binder. And you can see that the earlier books were not really that fancily done. There were illustrations also on the back covers of these little miniature books. Then when they changed to the new format, the illustrations got bigger and more colorful. And then the backs of the books got more intricately designed. But these books you can actually sit down and read. And I'm delighted that I have the whole set. I looked them up a little bit online and I was able to see individual books that were offered at a variety of different prices, but I have the whole set and that's got to be worth something. And they're a lot of fun to have. Whenever you collect something, if it's part of a set, you obviously want to be able to collect the whole set. So that's what I was sharing with you today. Well, well, thank you, Edie. That, thank you, Edie. Uh, exciting as always. Uh, and uh, we were able to get very clear images of your books today. Uh, oh, I should good. mention to yeah. everybody yeah. that I should mention to everybody that uh, because the video was a little short uh, starting, we are running about two minutes behind on the clock. So you'll want to give yourself a couple of extra minutes. Uh, never mind what the clock says. And now, well, I do have one more thing I could show if you wanted. Certainly. Okay. There are a lot of miniature books that are available that are done for advertisements. This one was done by Sears and Roebuck as a Merry Christmas little book. And what it was is Little Red Riding Hood. Now, I have found absolutely nothing on this book as to when. I looked in the book to see when it was published. There was nothing inside of the book. But the illustrations are done in black and white. But it, again, is the size that you can sit down and read the book. So with that, that's what I've got for today. 
Well, we it's not very often we get an encore, so thanks very much. And now, uh, Thorne, I understand you're going to tell us a bit about some of the most sought-after collectible books in America that you can only buy secondhand. Yes, uh, I am, but thank you. Your question. Well, I'll ask her some other time, but uh, yes. So uh, basically, uh, my family business. This is called R. Donnelly's. We're a Chicago-based printing company, although I understand now we're in 14 time zones or something like that. And we were founded by my great-grandfather in 1870. Well, he had a couple partners then. And 1871, I believe it was, there was a great Chicago fire, which uh, burned. And the partners decided not to continue. Apparently, my grandfather went to Chicago, raised some money on his signature went back and restarted the company. He ran it for a number of years. Uh, I'm a member of a club called the Grolier Club in New York. And when I joined the club, they give you its members. And I was surprised to see that old R.R. Donnelly was a member of the club back in 1895. He passed away in, I, I believe, a year or so after that. But anyway, his son, T.E. Donnelly, came, took over. And he's the second president of the company. And in 19, um, 1902 or 1903, I'm sorry, we did a promotional product for our customers and our employees. And uh, Legend Pet, uh, there was a company in Chicago that made razor blades and they gave out special razors to their good company and good customers. And you couldn't buy them in a store that you had to be a customer or a superior employee. And uh, my great uncle T thought that was a good idea. So we started making some called the They've been continuing with uh, print with three this year, 2017. So I guess it's 100, what is it, 114 years or something like that. You cannot buy one on the new market. They don't exist. They never have been sold. They've always been given away as presents. Uh, there's a fairly substantial used market in them now. We're still, still doing but some of them. the uh, the very um, people ask you know what was the uh, the most valuable books and all that and uh, I kind of did a little research on this I have a, a almost complete set and I'm in the process of, of finishing that out but apparently though the, the hardest volume is actually not the first year which was actually the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin and the conclusion here I'll read a a quote from my uh, great uncle, what he said in, in, uh, to start this, the uh, issue out. But it is uh, the addresses of the uh, presidents, Washington and Lincoln, and that's 1904. And I be we believe that's just because so many people collect Washington, Lincoln, and it's, so it, it, it's not just Lakeside Classics collectors, but it's collectors of, of memorabilia about Washington, Lincoln, or other American presidents. Another one which I was actually it's uh, rather curious because I don't believe I had it. It's called Fruits of Solitude. And apparently that's the uh, this book. And so maybe it's just been easy to lose. It's kind of the, the joke in the industry. I personally don't have one. That's one of the four or five I am missing. And another one that I happen to love is Memorable Speeches. Uh, that bad boy is uh, also very hard to find. And I think it was my Uncle Gaylord that says, quite possibly book horrible speeches so i don't know if that's true or not but at any rate so i thought i'd give you a little bit of a, a show and tell here every 25 years the uh, the books change color the first 25 years uh they were green i didn't i thought i, I had one to bring the the green rare and also they're also very fragile and i kept it in another box and somehow this morning i didn't make it so after the first years 25 years it was green uh, as you can see, they're small octavos. They all have, you know, gilt. They're high quality, not custom books by any stretch of the imagination. It was simply one of the attempts was to make it into a very, an example of the printer's art. Uh, after those, they went to blue books for another 25 years. Excuse me for that. And currently, they're they're uh, they're making uh, tur what we call turquoise. Uh, the, uh, how the color is going to come over, but the current editions are in turquoise. Uh, people ask about the the production runs. 
in the 1935 book, there was something about, uh, there was a fifth, they said that the first year was 1500 books. Nothing was ever really mentioned about that. I don't know that anybody in the, in the records of the family business, I'm sure it's there somewhere. Currently, supposedly a big secret, but uh, we have an awful lot of customers and we have well over 25,000 employees and the current production run is estimated around 40 to 50,000 books. So because of that, you know, the, uh, the prices, people tend to ask about the prices. The last 25 years or so, uh, there's a couple of people that specialize in, specialize in the books and the newer ones are somewhere between $10, $20. Uh, then the harder one I mentioned, in the thousands. Uh, Franklin is in probably another thousand dollars. So your price range in there, I've seen complete sets generally are around ten thousand dollars. Bad shape, uh, hard to say. I've never seen a, a, a set that was all in very fine. It's hard to find books very fine that are in sets like that. So there's your kind of price range on the thing. There are uh, some interesting titles. Uh, one of my first uh, favorite titles that I, and people have asked, do I read these books? And uh, no, I don't. I, I've read some of them. One of them was, was about Custer's. It was uh, uh, all, all about Custer. There's another one in the People's Kit Carson's. Uh, another one on Gettysburg. What all these books are is primarily in, in the public domain, out of print stories of American history. Although that's not really true anymore because that the company's gotten so large, I'm going to have to read this one because I honestly don't remember it. It was last year, a couple of years ago, books. Um, the current book is actually this year because we've gotten out so far. Is it is a book called "Interesting Narrative of the Life of Odulaya Iguano" or Gustavus Basso the African? That was last year's book. So we have. Uh, starting about 10 years ago, we've gone from strictly a North American uh, situation to a around the world. But uh, at any rate, I know Steve has an interesting topic. To so, Steve, are you ready to talk about yours? I know. Well, that continue on. I'm not cut by all means. If you were wrapped, I'm ready to roll. But if you're still rolling, I'm not wrapped yet. <laughs> well, okay. No, I mean, I, I was going to talk about them. Uh, they are what I was really going to end up with is my uh, great uncle. I think it summed up somewhat of the corporate philosophy, but the reason for these books, it was in, in the, autobiography, auto, excuse me, the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, the very first book, not the most valuable book, if you remember that, the second book. And what he said is, if in a modest way, this volume conveys the idea that machine-made books are not a crime against art, and the books may be plain but good, and good though not costly, its mission has been accomplished. And I think what he was dealing with there was back around the turn of the 19th century, you started to have, well, actually turn, the start of the 19th century, you started to have books being mass produced. It went from the letter press, the hand press, if you will, to steam presses, electric presses, hydraulic presses, whatever. So it went from a book that was truly made by hand to a book that was made by a lot of people. A good re result of that is today's private press movement. People still think that the... Uh, the commercial book, and, and granted, if you have a press run of 100,000 books, it's not a rare and collectible book. I make no bones about that. But what they were trying to do is prove that a large commercial printer, because we did Time Magazine, Life Magazine, Secretary Botanica, we still produce something like 30% of the books in the world, or whatever, whatever few magazines are left. We did the Sears catalog. We did uh, uh, Montgomery Ward catalog. We did most of the phone books for America. So I mean, we, we were a true, we are we're still a world's largest co printing company, a commercial printer. But we wanted to show, and we always books were made in house by generally by people in our apprentice program. We're still one of the few country, companies in America that has a true apprentice program with an apprentice, journeyman, master in the printing trades. And these always have been done in-house by our own students, if you will, that will be eventually become employees. And every one of them truly is not a uh, artistic masterpiece, but a very well, good, solid American-made book. Thank you. Steve? My pleasure. Thank you, Thorne. <clears throat> um, I've got something to discuss with anybody that is looking for places to sell books. 
almost in a storefront fashion without having to invest anything but your own time. <clears throat> it's a methodology that I call consignment location hunting, but it's not going after an antique mall and paying rent. It's something that I have done successfully on Miami Beach. If it wasn't proven, I wouldn't mention it. But if it works on Miami Beach where the stars are brighter and everything else is deeper, it's got to work in your neck of the woods too. So this is what I do. I go into a business, dependent on what it is, using an example of what was probably the fondest consignment location I had for a couple of years was the News Cafe on South Beach in Coconut Grove. I walked in with a picture of a collapsible bookcase on my phone and I said, this is the amount of space that I would need. We, would dis we discussed whether it was a priced fixed book or whether it was each book was individually priced in the cafe system we worked at each book was individually priced but what I'm trying to bring out for you who are listening to this program is let's say you're in an average town of let's say a hundred thousand people there's every kind of business in your town that you can think of from a sporting goods store to a restaurant to a health food store to a spa to whatever Go into those stores with a picture of a collapsible bookshelf set up with books on your phone and say, look, this is what I've done here. This is what I'm doing here. This is what I'd like to do with you. If it's a sporting goods store, custom theme the bookshelf to the sporting goods store, general sports book, things like that. If it's a shooting range, boy, what a place for hunting, fishing, firearms other types of books. If it's a haberdashery store, go in with fashion. If it's a ladies store, go in with the old Leslie's and Ballows of the monthly where they had all those great clothing patterns and designs. The idea is to custom tailor the book rack to the theme of the store. I have what I would say when I go out is a 75% batting average of getting the locations. I've gotten as many as two and three in one day. So thanks. You've just got to use your, you know, uh, charm and personality, you know, uh, and walk in and charge a percentage. You just want this permission of the owner to put up this collapsible bookshelf. Um, I suggest trying it in your hometown area. And if you do get some results, we'd love to know about it on the show. It's as simple as going into a store, telling them what you want to do. Nobody ever says no to books, usually. And if you do, we'd love to hear about it. So I see that we are just about at that moment on the big hand and little hand where it's time for me to say Thanks for joining us today. That's about all the time we have for today. We will be back next week with more mystery features and a mystery guest. During the week, please join us on the Rare Book Cafe's Facebook page where we invite you to post, comment, question, and share us with your friends and relations. And we love it when you like us. Our shows are archived on the Rare Book Cafe's Facebook page, the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair blog, and on on Book Fair's YouTube channel. You can also email us questions and comments. Send us photos of your book treasures and get a seat here in our internet studio at rarebookcafe at gmail dot at gmail.com, sorry. And don't forget to join me next Saturday from 12 to 2 for Bucks on the Bookshelf on WDBFradio.com. That's 12 to 2 Eastern Standard Time. Remember, the Rare Book Cafe is brought to you by the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair, celebrating 36 years of book selling, April 21st through 23rd, 2017. The Florida Antiquarian Book Fair features more than 100 dealers from around the country. For book lovers, it's paradise. And we will see you all next week.